Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. Welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. If you are tuning in for the first time, we are the longest running show in the history of the world on bisexuality. We're thrilled to have you. And if you have seen us before, welcome back. It's always nice to have you. Well, as I tell people, one of my favorite things about doing this show is I get to meet and talk with wonderful people from our community. And tonight I will be talking with a very wonderful ally of ours, uh, Barbara Satin, who is a transgender woman and is, has done so much for our community. She's 85 years old and still going strong and still brings a lot of contributions to our community. So Barbara, thank you so much for being on the show. You've been here before, but it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. Love to be, I'm glad I'm back. I love the new studio, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a new studio. And mm. yeah, you probably filmed in Minneapolis and St. Paul <laughs> back in the days. Yeah, I think I've been to almost every studio you had. So yeah. this, is, this is very nice. Yeah, yeah. And right next to Monster Brewing. Wow. I know, <laughs> yeah. You never know where things are going to right, go right, in this world. Yeah. Right. Well, you are looking fabulous, 85 years Thank old. You. Thank and you, you just had a great big birthday party with a few other people from the community. Yes. We, um, Beth Zemsky and Rever Rebo Re Rebecca Volkel and myself celebrated 196 years together. I'm 85, Beth is 60, Rebecca turned 50. We decided to do this birthday celebration together and to do it as a fundraiser for the National LGBTQ Task Force. Wonderful. Where I work. Okay, that's where you work. Yeah. Well, maybe we can, as long as you sure. work there, tell, tell us what you do there. What, what do you do? I'm the Assistant Faith Work Director. Okay. Uh, I work out of Minneapolis. Uh, we used to have our main, our main faith office here, um, and that has shifted, but I'm, I'm still here. Okay. And um, our work is primarily to bring the LGBT community uh, story to the faith communities and to help faith communities develop programs to uh, find acceptance within their local churches and within their denominations. And, uh, and also to get them involved around issues that are important to the LGBT community. It's one thing for the church community within the walls to be supportive of LGBT uh -huh. issues, but it's also important for them to take that affirmation outside into the world and to work on political campaigns or mm -hmm. just local issues, um, census, voting, whatever it might be, to get them supportive because they're important. Exactly. Yeah. And you and I have both been involved in politics here in St. Paul long enough to know <laughs> that if we didn't have the faith communities that joined in right. our efforts, we wouldn't have gotten this far in Minnesota, I don't think. And right. you can speak to that as Oh, absolutely. Much as the, uh, the, Human Rights Cam the Human Rights Act in 1983 came about um, not just because of the LGBT community, but it came about because of the business community, but more importantly, it came about because of the faith community. Right. Saying this is an important issue that we need to be behind. Yes. Um, and I know a lot of people within the uh, queer community, the LGBT community, have mixed feelings about faith communities. But, right. Um, when For they just have, cause. You know, <laughs> yeah. When they have actually uh, understood who we are, um, they have you know, stepped up and really, you know, marriage amendment. Mm -hmm. um, yep. They were very, very important in that, um, the Human Rights uh, Act. Um, that so, was 1993, that you're talking about the one in the state of Minnesota? Right. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that, that's an incredible event for this state. Um, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, we were the first state to provide protect, human rights protection for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. Yes, yes. And that was a big, big step forward uh, for the trans community. Um, and it's, stop and think about it, it's been over a generation in place. Yes. And the fallout has been nothing but incredibly positive. Um, and, you know, there, there was 
the world was going to come to an end if we passed this. Yeah, um, right, right. And before that, we had this stuff going on in St. Paul, because you're a St. Paulite. Mm -hmm. And we had, and St. Paul became the first city in the nation yeah. to protect people on the basis of all of the alphabet soup and gender right, identity. Right. Yeah, and the state follows. So, and, the, and the faith communities, again, if we wouldn't have had them come on board, right, right. That, that we wouldn't have that, I don't think. But that's an interesting situation because we had, we passed it and then we lost it yep. because of faith communities mm -hmm. and we gained it again. Yes, <laughs> yes, just, yes, yeah. Which, which spectrum, which end of the spectrum that's, that's right. of the faith communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. an interesting right. observation. Yeah. So. yeah, so you are working, you're doing God's work <laughs> and, and at a national level right. with the task force. Right. In fact, uh, we just completed creating change in Dallas and uh, uh, we have this national conference and uh, every year we go to a different city and we bring 3,000 to 4,000 uh, young and old uh, LGBT queer activists, uh, train them and uh, get them energized around mm -hmm. uh, issues and uh, uh, it's great work. Great and creating work. change, that's part of the, the task force. That's, that's it, your, it was a creation the, of the task force. Okay. And it is like, isn't that the largest LGBTQ yeah. alphabet soup it is. conference in right. the United States? It is, right. Wow. How yeah. many people do you draw at the conference, roughly? Uh, 3,000. All right. Sometimes we, okay. it depends, oftentimes where we're located because right. of, sometimes it's too expensive to go there, but sure. uh, we've had up to 4,000, uh, so. Wow. It's five, it's five days of intensive intensive work, but it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, there's something about connecting with all that energy mm -hmm. that is just so powerful and nourishing. And Well, for those of us who are old, it's wonderful to see the dynamism and, and passion of the young ones. Uh -huh. And for the young ones who come in and, and look and see all of these people who are the, the pioneers upon whose shoulders they are standing, yes. uh, it's, it's incredibly formative for them. So, yeah, it's a great event. It sure is. Well, and thank you for uh, doing all that work. Well, that is, I, I, I love doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we had talked a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. and you're 85, mm -hmm. and you've you came out and you've lived through a number of decades and experiences. Are you willing to talk about your story and what it was like to be you along the way? Yeah. I mean, that's, a, yeah. that's good history. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, so I, I came out fully uh, about age 60. Okay. And, uh, but I had known since about age five or six that I had something going on. Okay. But I didn't know what it was. Okay. Uh, there weren't words for it. Okay. Um, I, I discovered later on that transvestite was in the dictionary. Okay. Um, but that was sort of seen as um, not a really positive thing. And so, like so many of my peers uh, in my age group, we just did what we could to just live our lives and push all of this inside. Okay. So our lives were oftentimes very secretive and, mm -hmm. and we had very little opportunities to even explore who, what, what our feelings were and how they would play out. Um, and most of us also felt, well, this is something, I, uh, I always felt that uh, I had this curse from God. Oh my, okay. And, and um, how do I get rid of this? How do, I, how do I get rid of what's inside of me? And I would, you know, kneel to the side of my bed and pray, you know, take this away from me. Wow. And now I kneel on the side of the bed and I say, you know, thank you for making me understand that you made me this way. Um, you gave me this blessing so that I could do the work that I do to help other people understand. Um, but at the time, it was a challenge. And uh, so many my story is, is unique, but it's not different too much from many of the others. Uh, many of us got married. Mm -hmm. uh, we had raised families. Mm -hmm. um, I was blessed by uh, a 
lovely marriage and three wonderful children. Um, I now have seven grandchildren. Oh, congratulations. And a great grandchild. And a great grandchild, yeah. okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> They're um, all great, but there's really a, right. <laughs> a biological. Yeah. So, um, all of this time, though, I knew that I had this thing going on. Mm -hmm. And what I'd mentioned earlier to you was that, um, you know, how do I get to know what this is? I had nobody to talk to. My mother was a widow, okay. and I didn't, well, she was trying to raise four kids um, without a father, and uh, I didn't want to bother her. I knew that I couldn't, I was raised Roman Catholic. Okay. Um, knew I couldn't talk to the priest, because uh, the answer I get would be, oh, this is sinful, stop doing right. it, yeah. uh, which doesn't help. Um, and I couldn't talk to a doctor because the doctor would probably ask what more needs more information than, than he had that I could right, give. Right, exactly, so, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically I just stuck it all inside and I got married and had a very successful uh, business career, uh -huh. civic career, uh -huh. heavily involved in the city, uh, heavily involved in um, the, the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. um, but all the while knew that at some point somebody could find out wow. and discover this and, and all of that wonderful stuff. Um, I'm so proud of what my life was for the first 60 years. Yeah. All of that could come tumbling down. Yep, it could all be taken away. Right. Yep. Um, and so I just kept wondering what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. And then I retired from the work that I was doing. And after a few years, <clears throat> um, my children, my oldest son is a physical therapist. My second okay. oldest son is a psychotherapist. Okay, all right. My, my uh, third a daughter is um, a, cosmopo a cosmetologist. Okay. And if my body goes, I go to my oldest son. If my Mine gives me problems. I go to my second oldest son, <laughs> but I need my hair color. All right, I'm in. I go to my daughter. Yeah. Um, my second oldest son called me one day and he said, "Can we go down to the neighborhood bar and get a hamburger and a beer and just chat?" Uh -huh. And I thought, "Oh, my son needs to have dad some yeah, yeah, yeah. advice from dad." Well, no, that wasn't what it turned out to be. He wanted to know, you know, you're not the same person that you've been all the li all the time we were growing up you're you're now more harsh critical judgmental less fun to be around what's going on oh my so i said this Damien, after you retired hmm? after you retired right he, okay yeah and so i said you know i'm going to tell you something i've never told anybody um i'm transgender and he put his hand on mine and he said thank you for telling us we've been waiting for you to tell us <gasps> So, he had figured it out. Well, they had figured it out. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Sam. And they wondered how do we address this, and so we had a lovely conversation, and I realized that my fear that I was going to lose them. Yes. And, and this was, you know, the, the fear that so many of us at my and within my age environment uh, had was that we would either lose our jobs, we would lose our families, we'd lose our children. Um, we lose everything in our lives. Yes. Um, I realized that that wasn't going to happen, at least as far as my children are going to, were mm -hmm. concerned. So one of the things he said to me, uh, would you consider the thing, seeing a therapist? And I said, never have, but sure. So he set it up for me to see a therapist that uh, was worked in this, in this area. And I went to my first session with her as Barbara, mm -hmm. and I unburdened, I unloaded everything that had been in my head for, you know, 60 years. Ooh. Um, it was the first time I'd ever just let it all, let it all out. And her response to all of that was, you, know, you have lived your life thinking that you have been cursed by God. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe God made you this way, and that this might be a blessing. And I said, no, but living a 
life as a curse hasn't been fun. Yeah. So maybe I'll see about living it as a blessing. Uh huh. And basically, that was the change in all of this for me. Um, one of the aspects of that, uh, which was heart rendering uh, for the family, was the fact that I left the marriage and um, decided I needed to go find out who this Barbara Satin was. Sure. And um, we are now back together again. Okay. Um, and it's it's a, a wonderful experience, a wonderful journey. It's a challenging journey, but uh -huh. it's it's working well. But it gave me the opportunity to realize that um, you know I have something to give to the world. Yes. And that there is a lot of need for those of us who can be out, mm -hmm. which is a ma major problem still. Yes. Uh, we, you know, we have the human rights protection in Minnesota, but there still are many, many people who just cannot come out. They just, yes. can, their family won't accept it, their faith won't accept it, um, their employer, well, the human rights protection is supposed to take care of all of that. Right. There, are, there are ways of making it hard for oh, somebody sure. to yep, yep, come yep, out as yep. gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I, you know, I needed to, to do something about my ability to be out. So that basically got me started working within the trans community. I was the president of the City of Lakes Cross gender community. Mm -hmm. And tell we, people what that is. I don't know if that still exists or what, what well, that is. It does is. exist, but okay. it, what's interesting is it, the human rights protection that we, we got um, was a two-edged sword. Um, the City of Lakes Cross gender community is a support group for trans people. And, at the time I was involved with it, you had to go through like three different interviews. I was so secretive because mm -hmm. people were so fearful of being discovered. Mm -hmm. And we met um, different places, primarily in, in uh, gay bars, because they would accept us. Mm -hmm. Didn't understand us, but they would yeah, accept yeah. us. Um, we would have basically a, a coded way of finding out when the meetings were and such. So it was a really challenging um, time to be trans. But then when the human rights protection went into place, I realized that we had about 400 members and they didn't all show up at the same time, but um, the numbers were going down. The meeting were not as well attended and then became even less attended. I realized What's happening is that they don't need the support yeah. that they got from being in the secret society. Yes, they can be out yes. in the world, yeah, and they yeah. were. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other part of what I discovered in my work with the trans community was that we were well, relatively unknown to the LGB community. They didn't understand us mm -hmm. for the most part. And so I realized that if we're gonna be part of the acronym, that they needed to know who we were and mm -hmm. they needed to see us yes and they needed to know our stories so mm -hmm. i basically said to the trans community i said you know you are doing well for yourselves you have enough people to support yourselves i'm going to begin doing my work within the lgb community and i was offered the opportunity to go on uh, a particular board and i went on that and then i got another opportunity I think in my career I have been on the board or on advisory committees to every single LGBT community uh, organization in the, the Twin Cities. In the Bi Cities here, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's um, uh, it's been a wonderful experience, and I think I helped um, those organizations understand who we are. Um, we have incredible people who are in the, in the trans and non-binary, uh, gender non-conforming community, the gender, the non-binary communities. Um, but our stories aren't, aren't well understood. And I keep telling people that, you know, we have to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. Someone at, at Creating Change two years ago got on the stage, a dear friend of mine, and said, you know, our stories are killing us. I mean, our, our silence is killing oh, us. Oh, okay, sure. 
It's uh, we need to tell our stories so people understand who we are. Right. And as people hear who we are and understand what we have done and what our feelings are and our expectations and our, our goals and our objectives in life, it changes people's attitude. Yep. Uh, they may not fully uh, approve, but they understand us more. Um, and we, I still see that as a, as a critical issue that we uh, need more opportunity to have people hear who we are. That's why I, I, I won, I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity to, to uh, <laughs> uh, have this time to talk and tell my story. Um, and I know you're doing this with others and I think that's great. Well, you know, as you're talking about your story and the boards you've been on and your career before in, in business and being a successful business person, you know, I'm reminded about um, the tragedies of discrimination when people can't be themselves. Because mm. when you are able to be yourself and bring yourself and your skills, you had skills that a lot of folks in the queer community didn't have. Mm -hmm. And you could serve in these leadership positions, you could be on boards, you could help. I mean, you know, we haven't even touched the surface of some of the things you've done, but I know that you were involved in, in uh, developing housing for uh, elderly GLBTQ people and you know, just a, a whole lot of things. And thank God that you were able to do that and to be you and to bring all of you to the table. Well, I've been blessed. I, I, I really have. Living life as, as a blessing has been yeah, yeah. Uh, a wonderful experience. So. Yeah. You wanted to talk about aging in the trans community. I don't know if, if you... Yeah. If, no, that's fine. That's it's, where we it's, go it's, next. It's, but. it's also a part of... Uh, the faith work, and it's also part of uh, my involvement with the trans community. Um, I found a, a church called uh, Spirit of the Lakes Church in Minneapolis, which was a LGBTQ church. Because at first I thought when I came out that I didn't want to go church shopping, and I knew that I wasn't going to find a home in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd be spiritual on my own, and that didn't work for me. I needed community. Mm -hmm. And so I found Spirit of the Lakes Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a period of time, um, a number of other trans people who realized that if, if Barbara found that well, that was welcoming, maybe we should go. Mm -hmm. uh, we attracted a fair number of trans people who came to church. And one Sunday after, evening after church service, um, somebody went home and, and uh, um, had a, a trans woman went home and had a stroke. And uh, oh my. she, in getting s service in the emergency room and getting service at the VA, she was a veteran, and then in her rehab work, all of her identity as a trans woman, she had to ignore that and become the straight man again. Oh my. Uh, Gail had to become Glenn. Okay. And, uh, it struck a chord in my mind and also in a couple of other people, Matt, the pastor of our church mm -hmm. and uh, another uh, dear friend of mine. And we realized that little is at that point was being said or done around aging issues for mm -hmm. the uh, uh, LGBT community, let alone the trans community. And so we decided we needed to do more work around aging issues and we formed an organization called um, well, all of a sudden I've forgotten after all these years, um, GLBT Generations. Okay, I remember that, yeah. And yeah. Um, from that came the idea that uh, Spirit of the Lakes Church was looking to redo the church. It was, it was a, a single block building on Lake Street. And it was it an had old this, garage at one time, wasn't it? Yeah. Like an auto? Right. Yeah. And it had this gigantic parking lot out in front. And it was, Lake Street was redeveloping and um, developers wanted to come and take over the property and buy us out and send us to the suburbs. And we realized that no, we needed to do something for, our, for the community, for our community and for the um, uh, community, the neighborhood community. And they didn't want more commercial development, they wanted people. Mm -hmm. So we decided we would um, do housing, and we pushed the uh, church community, uh, GLBT Generations members pushed the church community to focus on aging LGBT people to do senior housing. 
And we started the project. We found a nonprofit developer called PRG, um, which still does great work in the Twin Cities. And they helped us. Uh, we started this as a co-op. It was going to be ownership. Oh, OK. And it was well received. And we had 75% of the units were already spoken for when all of a sudden the housing market collapsed in, oh, no. in 85. Oh. And um, so we um, thought, well, this isn't going to go any place. Uh, 95, I think it was. Um, we, this wasn't going to go any place, and PRG came back and said, "Now look, you had a large number of people who wanted to have ownership in a senior housing that was focused on LGBT affirmation, but you also had a lot of people who really wanted to live as an LGBT out person and as they age, but they couldn't afford to. Okay. So maybe you should think about affordable housing. Okay. So we shifted with the help of." PRG and the city and the county uh, and the neighborhood organization. Surprisingly, uh, the two organizations that city, uh, city neighborhood groups that uh, Spirit of Lakes was in, both of them were so excited about what we were doing that they donated money to the oh project my. rather than being not in my backyard. Uh -huh. It oh, was, wow. what wow. can we do to help? Wow. And so when we shifted to uh, rental, it was sort of like, oh, well, that, we've got a lot of rental, yeah. but the, you're too, the idea is too important. So they stuck with us. And we opened in uh, 2013, uh, and it's doing really, really, really well. And what's, I think, exciting about it is not only is it a place for aging LGBT people, but because of the Fair Housing Act, we can't discriminate. Okay. They couldn't discriminate. Yeah, so we uh, have 60%, maybe 65% of the units are LGBT. The rest are not. Okay. What's interesting is the rest are East African, primarily Somali. Interesting. Um, and you would think that it would be oil and water, that this wouldn't mix. And it's been incredible to watch the formation of this community within yes. this building. Yes. Um, the LGBT people think, this is my home. I'm going to be here no matter what. Uh -huh. And the, um, the Somali community, the same way. This is our home. These are our people. Wow. It's been wonderful to see. Um, so we were the second LGBT affordable housing project in the, uh, in the country. There have been maybe five more, uh, some more in the market, in the uh, drawing board. But we still, it's still a critical issue critical for uh, aging uh, LGBT people across the country. I just got the rap signal. Okay. <laughs> and I can I, get I just, talking to No, 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 you <laughs> didn't. But I just want to thank you so much for all that you've done and are continuing to do. You are an inspiration for all of us. And, you know, we wouldn't be as wonderful a GLBTQ community without the likes of you. Mm, thank you. So thank you, Barbara Satin, for being on the show. Thank Would you. Would you join us in our signature goodbye? Absolutely. All right. Bye for bye now. Bye-bye.